Chapter 10. The Fourth Dimension From earliest times, man has been dimly conscious of a space dimension transcending, overarching, and interpenetrating the material world of time, sense, and place. To understand and explore this dimension, one must have an extension of sight, hearing, and feeling. If any man hath eyes to see, let him see. If any man hath ears to hear, let him hear. On the plane of three dimensions, our eyes and ears are attuned to the world of matter and effects. They do not register the vibrations and radiation of spirit because the mind is still thinking and working through the body. On the plane of the fourth dimension, without earthly attachment, they are attuned to the voice of God or the world of cause. We have clues to this dimension in the words of Jesus, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, and in his system of teaching to the masses he taught in parables, to a few he unfolded the inner or deeper meaning of his teaching. In the ancient cult of Hermeticism, Mythiorism, and other mystery religions of Asia Minor, Egypt, and Greece, the secrets were always zealously guarded. They were not given to the masses, lest in ignorance they might be abused or misused. But right now, knowledge of the fourth dimension is available to all. When we inquire into the nature of this dimension, what do we find? We find, first of all, that it is a dimension of infinity. It is the state of consciousness in which heaven and earth, God and man, come together. Here you are everything and nothing at the same time. Here you find your life when you lose it. It is a place of being and not of having. It is a dimension of super-life, super-power, super-mind, super-man, super-healer, and super-demonstrator. It is a dimension of height and depth. It is the climax of all spiritual endeavor. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it, it seemed good in thy sight. And he turned him into his disciples, and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things ye see. For I tell you, that many prophets and kings have desired to see these things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear these things which you hear, and have not heard them. I am, or I am not. In the fourth dimension, now is the only time there is. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That which ought to be is. That which can be is. That which will be is. That which was evil now becomes good. That which was sick now becomes well. That which was poor now becomes rich. The incurable now become curable. The impossible now becomes possible. I can do nothing now because I can do all things. On the plane of the three dimensions, material objects have the appearance of solidity, but the physicists working on the higher plane will prove that they are not solid. For instance, it is a fact that a table is solid. It is also true that it is not solid. The physicist will show you that it is a mass of teeny, dancing, whirling electrons. So it is with disease, circumstance, and the conditions of the relative plane. They are real or unreal according to the plane from which they are viewed. On the material or three-dimensional plane, we are dealing with things that change. They are not the same today as they were yesterday. On the fourth dimensional plane we deal with the timeless isness or nowness of spirit which has no changing content. On the lower plane sickness, poverty, and unhappiness are real and sometimes incurable. On the higher plane they are unreal, unsubstantial, and powerless. In reality adverse conditions cannot affect us even on these planes, for they have nothing to support them. The metaphysician insists on the now as the accepted time for everything. The past is but a memory. The future does not exist. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now is the only time God can help us or give to us. Now is the only time we can do anything, accomplish anything, or receive anything. It is now or never. If the now is good, the future will be good. If the nowness and isness of God respond are impressed on the subconscious mind, it will work for us in the present. If the now is the soul of every affirmation, treatment, and prayer, they will accomplish what they are sent out to do. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. It is always our realization of the now that brings him into manifestation. Would you enter the fourth dimension? Then think, speak, and act in terms of I am. It is the only language spirit knows and the only one to which it responds. I am healthy. I am strong. I am young. I am happy. I am prosperous. Make your choice, and without coercion or compulsion, be that which you are. The quality of your living is determined by the tense in which you think, work, live, and pray. Divine Protection In times of great danger, millions of persons have turned with confidence and assurance to these words in the 91st Psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
We can use this psalm with assurance because of the countless miracles that have been accomplished through it. We can rest secure in the promise that no evil shall come nigh the abode of him who dwells in God. For the promise is that, He who will give his angels charge over thee, and keep thee in all thy ways. We can be assured that he will show salvation to those who know but one presence and one power in the universe, but to those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. There were no automobiles, airplanes, trains, or hotel fires in David's day, but there were other dangers, and David knew perfectly the sense of security that accompanies the habitual practice of the presence of God. Divine protection is not secured through the temporary suspension of natural laws by divine intervention, nor is it realized through safety devices, guns, brakes, sirens, or red and green lights. It is a result of the consciousness of God's presence and of habitual obedience to divine law. The world has long sought a bulwark against danger and has failed to find it in material devices. Safety must stem from something more reliable and dependable than block signals, fixed boundaries, automatic fences, and electric controls. To be effective, it must not only guarantee security in the afterlife, but must cover all the exigencies, extremities, vicissitudes, complexities, perplexities, change, misfortune, and mishap of this life. Safety does not depend upon parroted words, coats of mail, or bulletproof vests, but upon the destruction of the belief in two powers, and the acceptance of the union of man's mind with God's mind. The only reason man is endangered any time is that he believes in separation. When this belief is healed, we shall know that we are safe. We shall be safe because we are controlled, directed, and guided by divine law. Use your gifts. When Timothy was meeting reverses and failures, St. Paul said, Stir up the gifts which is within you. We have each received the gifts that was implanted in us in the beginning. Spiritual gifts, energies, capacities, qualities, are not things that have to be thought, willed, or prayed into being, but powers that must be released and expressed. When Jesus fed the five thousand, he stirred up the gift inherent in the five loaves and the two small fishes. When he restored Lazarus to life, he stirred up the gift that was no longer apparent. When he was healed the sick, cast out demons, and cleansed the leopards, he stirred up the gift that for some reason had been denied. The one talent man was not deceitful, treacherous, wicked, or wasteful. He did not squander his gifts, but he did not allow it to rust. He failed to use what he had. The question asked is not, what do you have, but how are you going to use what you have? Sickness, trouble, and limitations are not the punishment of a jealous and vengeful God, but the overt results of our failure to recognize the talent given us and to keep it active. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men or manifestations unto me. It is not more of a more favorable circumstance or a better environment that makes for successful, harmonious, and buoyant living, but a stirring up of the spiritual gift already inherent within us. What did St. Paul mean by his advice? He meant that we must give out or express what is already within the soul. We must let God come into being. We must let Christ have his way in mind, heart, body, and soul. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Saved from what? Saved from the disorder, dislocation, disease, and disfigurements that take place on the circumference of life. One is saved from danger, another from failure, another from disease, and another from disgrace. In other words, man is saved by his false belief only by looking unto God, by letting the mind be in him, which was also in Christ Jesus. Proving your ownership. Fear not, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Prayer is merely proving your ownership of something that is already yours. It is the means of manifestation your possessions. It is the method of connecting up with your inherent power and of establishing your relationship or title to whatever you desire, so that it can and will be expressed in your experience. Jesus pointed out that there is no such thing as an unfulfilled desire. Just as there can be no problem without an answer, there can be no demand without a corresponding supply. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. The fulfillment of every desire coexists with the principle of truth. The very presence of the desire is proof that what is desired is already established in God. Why, then, are there so many unanswered prayers? If God answers before we call, if every one that asks receive us, and if God is no respecter of persons, why do some demonstrations and others fail? We have the answer in the words of St. James. Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss. The answer is in and determined by the prayer. There are times when our prayers are integrated or touch reality with God through the subconscious mind. Those prayers will always be answered. There are other times when we ask amiss or in a state of separation. 
When we pray with a mind full of contradictions, denials, doubts, fears, worries, and anxieties, the negatives become a part of the prayer. The futile prayer denies the good we are seeking. Jesus gave us the key to successful prayer when he said, All things whatsoever ye shall ask in a prayer, believing ye shall receive them. And when ye pray, believe that ye have. Over and over again, Jesus stressed the importance of belief. If there is to be a demonstration, there must first be a belief, or a mental equivalent to the thing asked for. Why? Because the mind cannot hold what it rejects. It cannot believe what it denies. By mental equivalent, we mean that a mind must not only comprehend the meaning of the word that the intellect speaks, but that it must be receptive to the good. The man who is sick in his thought cannot demonstrate health which he accepts in his sickness. It is only as he drops his belief in sickness and enters into a state of health that health abides in him. He does not change his body from sickness to health by praying, but by changing his belief regarding sickness. The health is there all the time when he turns to the realities of existence. It is manifested for him.